Hello, my name's Anne Marie Doherty, and I'm the CEO of the Bob Woodruff Foundation. On behalf of Veterans on Wall Street, Women Veterans on Wall Street, and the Bob Woodruff Foundation, I'm honored to welcome you to today's timely conversation. An especially warm welcome to our esteemed speakers, Wes Becton and Terry Garrett. From the impact of COVID-19, which exposed the deadly consequences of structural health inequities to the movement of racial justice that made global headlines last summer, we've seen more and more that people are having conversations they've never had before about race and racism. There is a profound interest from individuals and organizations to keep those conversations going and to better understand how to weave racial equity into the DNA of their work. Of special interest to the audience who's here today is how the veteran experience layers into that effort. As a leader of a foundation supporting veteran serving nonprofits, we know the importance of addressing equity in our work. Collectively in 2020, our network served 42% women and 47% people of color. It's essential that we continue scaling up our capacity and measure and assess the equity outcomes of our programs. It's also essential that we continue to listen and engage in what can be uncomfortable conversations to understand and improve our role in creating a better, more equitable future for veterans and their families. Today, you'll hear from Terry Garrett, U.S. Air Force veteran and Chief of Staff of the Global Cybersecurity Lead at EY. Joining Terry is Wes Becton, CEO and co-founder of George Washington Street Partners. A former infantry officer and graduate of the Army's Ranger School, Wes led U.S. and Korean soldiers in the demilitarized zone in Korea and later served as the commander of the U.S. Army's Honor Guard Company in Washington, D.C. Wes has extensive executive leadership and governance experience in a wide range of industries, including banking, education, and healthcare. He is the former board chair of Northeastern Illinois University and currently serves on the boards of Elmhurst College and Pan American Bank. Wes and Terry, it's great to have you here today, and I want to thank you both for your time and insights. All right, so we're live. Thank you everybody for joining. I appreciate your patience. Uh, Wes, hopefully you can hear me and things are going well on your end as well. All right, wonderful. Um, so thanks everybody to this fireside chat about uncomfortable conversations about race. Um, and I guess Wes, just sort of, you know, kick this off and, you know, start this dialogue with you. Um, just one primary question. Where were you when you heard about George Floyd and how did you feel? Well, Terry, uh, thank you for the question and hello to everyone that's logged in and uh, thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts with you uh, today. I'm very excited about this and uh, it is an uncomfortable conversation, uh, but it doesn't have to be. So specifically about George Floyd, I, I remember it very well. I was sitting on my, uh, my patio and I was uh, just finished a Zoom call. I was wearing a, a black tank top and it was a warm summer day. And I, I just, as I watch it, and I, I'll be honest with you, I couldn't watch the whole video. But as I watched that video, I, I couldn't help but think, wow, that, that could have been me. That could have been my soon to be 95 year old dad who fought in three wars for this country. That could have been one of my two sons. And it, it just made me, profoundly sad, but uh, hopefully as we'll talk about here in just a few minutes, uh, I, I think when something like that happens, uh, I'm a firm believer that, that something good can come from it as well. And uh, I'll say this and maybe create a little bit of a controversy. I, I love Gen Xers, I love millennials, and what I love about them the most is that they're not going to quit. <laughs> they're not going to give up. They're not going to stop with pushing uh, for social justice. And if you think back to the protests, the riots uh, that happened over the summer, um, 
those groups weren't all black, weren't all white, weren't all Latino, weren't all of anything. It was a movement, I think, powered by this generation that's saying, hey, enough's is en enough is enough. We're demanding change. Okay, great. Yeah, um, I know that when uh, when it happened, um, I very similar situation. I had just gotten off a call and I was actually taking a little bit of a break. And I just, you know, one of the things I like to do when I take a break is pop on the TV and just, you know, do a quick scan of the news. I'm a little bit of a news junkie as well as do a quick scroll through on Twitter. And so um, when, when I saw it happen, uh, I'm going to be honest, I wasn't surprised. Um, you know, this is something... This is something that's been happening for as long as is as, as our living memory in terms of, you know, our presence in the country. I just think, you know, from my perspective, more of it just happens to be caught on tape. And, um, you know, I, I think the key difference and I, I share a little bit of your optimism is that, the, you know, the response to what happened over the summer, especially powered by a lot of our young people, was extremely positive. And I think it was really good to see that momentum. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, you know, I'm interested in more than just protests. Um, I want to see change. I want to see public policy change. Um, you know, hopefully we see individual change with respect to how people, you know, think, perceive and act when interacting with different groups of people. And, you know, hopefully we see lasting change. So, I mean, it, it, I, I'm cautiously I, I say I'm cautiously pessimistic and that I think that there are good signs, but by the same token, you know, the proof is really going to be in the pudding with respect to, you know, what do we see long-term coming out of it? Yeah. Thank you so much for that. I, th I think there's a lot of wisdom in what you say. And I think it also shows the, the diversity of thought that can exist. So I'm 55, assuming you're, uh, you're in that age group, maybe a little bit younger, uh, but we may come at it from two different perspectives, but, when people look at us and assume we think the same thing, that's part of that narrative that, that has to be changed. So one of the good things that came out of actually two of the good things, uh, you know, so I live in suburbs of Chicago, uh, great little neighborhood. We've been there for 25 years since I got out of the, uh, since I got out of the army and, you know, in the town we live in, I'm on the university's board that's there, been the president of the Rotary Club, my wife's on the library board. We're very active in the community. Um, but my neighbors were all surprised when, after Mr. Floyd was murdered, I told them, hey, look, you know, I've lived here for a long time. You all know me, but I don't go for a walk in my own neighborhood without my dog. And my dog's not a scary dog. He's this cute little border collie thing. But they, they, they didn't understand why. And so it gave me an opportunity to, to tell my story a little bit. And my story goes, hey, if you saw somebody that looks like me wearing a hoodie in your neighborhood and you don't know it's me, what's your first reaction? So the reality is our level of consciousness, all of our life experiences up to that point inform us as to whether, as to what our opinion is of that person. And if your life experiences have told you that, hey, somebody that looks like that is a threat, it's going to trigger something deep in your amygdala. It's that fight or flight response. And I can tell you, um, people are going to have one of a number of reactions. One, they may walk by me and say hi, walk by and hope I don't notice them. Maybe they'll walk on the other side of the street. Maybe they'll call the police. Or as we saw a year ago yesterday in Georgia, maybe you get chased out of my neighborhood and somebody would, would take a shot at me. Um, th those are those are my realities. Yeah. And, when I explained those to my neighbors, it gave them a different lens. It gave them a different way uh, to think about this. And, you know, I was given a talk very similar to this to a, uh, to a men's group in Elmhurst. And the first thing that happened was I went to the, uh, to the leader of this group and I said, hey, look, are you... Uh, are you going to let the police know there's going to be a gathering in the park of more than a certain number of people? And he said, well, why, why would I, why would I do that? And I said, well, let, let me tell you a story um, because you're going to have a diverse group of people in our town. I said, when I moved to my town in uh, 1995, I called the, uh, the chief of police, the police department. And I said, Hey, I'd just like you to know that I'm getting out of the military. I'm going to be moving to this address 
and I just want to let you know that I'm black and I live there. And when I told this this guy that's running this men's group this, he was shocked. Like, why why would you do that? Again, maybe I don't need to do that, but at the time I felt like I did, and uh, it opened his eyes. And what he did is he said, "Oh my gosh, I never would have considered uh, doing that." But anyway, I'm giving this talk, and at the end of it. A guy stood up and said, hey, look, you know what? I agree with everything you're saying, but where I'm from, back in my hometown, uh, people don't see it the same way. And I've got family members that think differently. I've got friends back home that think differently. And I don't want to lose those friendships. And I, I remember very clearly, I said, hey, you know, that's great self-awareness. You, you, you picked up on that. But let me ask you a question. How important is this issue of diversity, equity, and inclusion to you? How, how important is it? Because at the end of the day, if it's not all that important, you're probably not going to say anything. But I want you to think back to that, that murder of, of George Floyd, the officer that put his knee on his neck. Remember, there were at least three other officers that were around that knew what was going on. But none of those three officers had the courage to stand up and, and intervene and say something. And I said, hey, if this issue back home with your friends and family isn't that important to you, really there's not a lot of difference between you and those those three officers that, that stood by and watched Mr. Floyd get murdered. Um, you know, one of the things that I tell all my clients is, look, if you're a leader, being a leader takes courage. It, it takes being willing to, to stand up and, and say something that might be popular, that might not be popular. You may have to, you may have to deal with the consequences um, associated with that. So when I had finished this conversation, again, I think that that lens that he had on started to change. And again, I, I think that there are some positive things uh, that have that have come out of it. One more thing, then we can we can move on to the next question. So my, my dad is uh, is my hero. My dad, as I said, will be ninety five years old um, this year. Uh, my dad fought in three wars, actually uh, four if you count the Cold War, and five if you count the fact that he had COVID and beat it. Um, but he fought in, fought in those wars, fought for our country. When he enlisted in the military at the end of World War II and fought in the Philippines, he fought in a segregated unit. When I give this talk to high school students, like, well, what does that mean? No, literally, if you were a black person, you served in this unit. If you're a white person, you served in this unit. That was the law at the time. And in the Korean War, when he went over with the 3rd and the 9th Infantry Regiment, the 2nd Infantry Division, he fought in a segregated unit until, until President Truman desegregated the military uh, with, a, with an executive order. And, oh, by the way, that wasn't for social reasons. That's not why it was done. Um, it was done because we were getting our butts kicked. We got kicked down to the Pusan perimeter and we needed to regroup and the commanders in the field said, hey, look, you know what? Um, we don't have the time to uh, figure out whether black soldiers go here or white soldiers go here. We're going to put them all together. And guess what they figured out? They figured out that they actually fought very well uh, together because as I'm sure it was your experience, Terry, with a lot of the veterans on the uh, call today, you know, when you're cold, tired, hungry, miserable, and just flat out afraid or maybe even homesick and somebody offers to help you, <laughs> you don't care what color they are or where they're from or how much money they have in the bank account. You're just grateful for that help. And I think that's one of the things that the military does so well. And so every time I get a chance to tell that story about the hard work that the military put into desegregating and the work that they put into making it is about as close to a meritocracy as we've seen in our country, um, I think the needle moves. And I, I think that people start to see things with uh, different lenses. And, you know, back to this uh, millennial generation, um, I think I can share this story. Uh, my son's on this call. I apologize in advance. Uh, but, you know, my son works for a company and, you know, when everything happened around, uh, 
around uh, January 6th, he wrote a letter to the president of his group and said, hey, you know, we can do better than this. I'm not going to mention what company it is, really doesn't matter. Um, but there's other companies that are that are making us look bad because we haven't taken a stance. And the first thing I said to him was, you know, you're a good writer. He went to Middlebury College, by the way, if there's any Middlebury grads on the call, but he, he is a great writer. And the other thing I said is, you know, if they don't make you a partner today, your bedroom is still available because I never would have said something like that to my boss, but he did. And I don't think he's alone. I think that's mm. that age group that's going to push and push and push until they see change. And that's why I'm just so incredibly hopeful about our future. Even during some of the dark days, I'm still hopeful because there are people mm -hmm. pushing the envelope and saying that there's got to be some change in diversity, however you define that. OK. Yeah, I, I think that's that's an excellent point, Wes. Um, and I, I think just as you were talking, there there are two sort of important questions. You can take them in, in whatever order you want. But I, I really think they do. They are important with respect to the themes that you mentioned. I think the first question that I have for you is, why is diversity and inclusion important? Um, I, and this is just in reference to a comment that you made to the person you're talking to about, yeah. you know, hey, is it important to you? Because if it's not, yeah. you know, how you act and think accordingly will follow. If it is, how you act and think accordingly will follow, right? And then I think the second question, and I, I might take part in this as well, but it, with respect to your military service, like how were conversations about race when you were wearing the uniform different than how you have conversations in race as a civilian? So, you know, either way you want to take those. Those are some great questions. And, uh, you know, why is it important? So I, I think a great place to start is just with some quick definitions. So sometimes people hear DEI and it's like one thing, but actually it's three very distinct things. So diversity is all about differences. It's about, are you sitting in a room and does everybody look the same as you? Is everybody the same gender? Or if same skin color, same ethnicity? Or did you all go to the same schools? Is there any diversity of thought? There's some research out there that says that management teams that are diverse have a 33% gain in innovation over non-management teams. So there isn't a lot of research on this, believe it or not. Uh, maybe somebody wants to fund some, but there's not a lot of research on this. But the closest thing you can come to is this idea of groupthink. And we all understand that, hey, if everybody's thinking the same way, you're not going to have a lot of innovation. So equity, think the scales of justice. Think, uh, think fairness. Is it fair? Is it just? Does everyone have equal access to the same resources. You, you really want to get angry sometime, look at how schools in some states are funded by personal property taxes and the inequity associated with that. So inclusion is, uh, is really different because the, the reality is it is really easy to exclude, but it takes work to include. And so there's an author I love. Her name is, uh, her name is, uh, yeah, I love her so much. The name of her book is called Mismatch. And uh, what she does, she comes at it from a design engineering cat home. She comes at it from a design engineering standpoint. And what she says is, hey, look, when the computer mouse was designed, if you were left-handed, you were excluded. Like, there weren't enough of you to us, for us to design this mouse so that it could work. You know, if you're left-handed, you're going to have to learn how to use it with the right hand. So you were excluded if you're left-handed. And sometimes that resonates with people. But here's what really resonates with people to help them understand this idea of inclusion. Think back to that time when you were on the playground and everybody got picked to be on a team except for you. Or think back to that time that everybody was invited to a party except you. If you're a parent, everybody's kid was invited to a party except for you. That, that's that idea of of feeling excluded. So that's easy, we do that every day. But man, to make people feel included, it takes work. Another one of my favorite authors, Isabel Wilkerson, who wrote a book called Cast, does a masterful job of explaining 
the caste system in India and relating that to the experience of black Americans in the United States and relating that to the experience of Jews in Nazi Germany. But what she says is this idea of inclusion has some fear baked into it because people feel like that, hey, if this other group is allowed to do that, whatever that other group is, that means that I'm going to have to become less. So it becomes this fear-based thing where I have to hold on to my place on the rung of life because if I let anybody else up there, by definition, it means I need to come down. And what she's saying is that's just uh, that's just not true. So why is diversity, equity, and inclusion important? Well, um, you're going to come up with more innovative ideas. Um, this millennial workforce that I've been uh, talking about, uh, they want to make sure that you don't just have a value statement that says, hey, we're a diverse company and we value equity and we value inclusion. No, they, they want to they get behind the scenes. They want to see, hey, how are you really doing that? What are you doing in your community? I want to see that. And guess what? Those are the companies they want to work for. And as you know, I'm sort of in that baby boomer, born 65, sort of baby boomer, sort of a Gen Xer. Um, but as that age group of boomers starts to age out, starts to retire, where are you going to get your workers? The studies are showing that, you know, hey, unless you get this diversity, equity, inclusion, and you live it, you're just not going to be able to find that high quality workforce that you need. And oh, by the way, if your company was founded in 1950 or before, and you're still recruiting the same way you did in 1950, and you're saying, I can't find good candidates, that drives me crazy because you got to do something different. You can't just keep doing the same things. Go to different schools. Find different yeah. people. They're out there. And that's just a cop out when people say that there are not um, there are not enough qualified people of a certain race or a certain ethnicity or a certain gender. It's just not true. You're just not fishing in the right holes. Um, the second hmm. question was, how does it differ in the military? Well, um, yeah, I could probably tell you a story. Unfortunately, we lost him back in 2012, but his name was Jerry Cashin. Jerry and I were uh, platoon leaders together. Uh, actually, he was a platoon leader. I became the XO of his company in the old guard. Uh, this is the late 80s. And uh, Jerry and I became very, very close, really close friends. But here's the deal. Jerry was from Pulaski, Tennessee. Uh, if you know anything about history, Pulaski has a very famous resident, Nathan Bedford Forrest, who kind of founded a terrorist organization known as the Ku Klux Klan. So that was Jerry's lens. That was the experience Jerry had. I don't know if Jerry had ever seen anybody look like me until he joined the army, but here he is, you know, eating in my home, us becoming great friends. That doesn't always happen in the civilian world because you know, let's face it, we can be still very segregated in, in where we choose to live. We can be very segregated in where we choose to worship. We can be very segregated in other areas of our life. But when you create these situations like sports, like the military, where people work together and they realize, hey, we've got more in common than we do that separates us, it becomes just incredibly incredibly powerful and uh th th again th th that's where my uh, that's where my hope is but again going back to my dad uh enlisted in uh, in uh segregate armed world war ii retired as a lieutenant general in 1983 commanded the largest uh army corps in the uh in the, in the free world i think is what we used to say back in the day uh in seventh corps in germany and uh you know that tells me that, that things can change but you know people come into the military with all kinds of different backgrounds the military does a fantastic job of making it suck for everybody <laughs> and you have this common experience where you're just trying to get through it color doesn't become an issue and I think that there's a lot that the civilian world can learn from the military in terms of how to structure this. But again, it takes hard work. It takes, it takes courage. It takes vulnerability. It takes leadership. Yeah, I mean, I, I think those are great points. And I would definitely agree, just, you know, given my experience in the military. And I, I, think, there's, I, I think there's one key difference. Um, 
between the environments as well. And I think a lot of that is rooted in the shared experiences that we have, um, whether that's basic training or tough deployment or, you know, the extreme, you know, even combat. And I think that um, compared to when I was in the military versus, you know, my experience as a civilian, I just frankly had more direct conversations. Um, I think people were a little bit more willing to be vulnerable, I think in part because we had those shared experiences. And I think in part because they were just sort of open and curious and they didn't let saying the right thing get in the way. They just kind of said it and you kind of hash things out and you had a conversation and you came to an understanding, you came to an agreement and, you know, both of us move, you know, everybody move forward as a unit um, to really do the mission really well. And I think that, you know, in the civilian world, you know, kind of keeping a little bit of that directness and that vulnerability and being willing to just engage in those tough conversations um, and coming at it with the right spirit and the right heart, you know, even if the exact right words don't come out, just being, being willing to do the work um, from my perspective moves the needle a long way. Um, which kind of leads me to yeah, just, a, Jerry, that's, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, you know, there's a fantastic book and course. It's actually called Crucial Conversations. I'm not sure if you've seen it or not. Have you seen it? Yes. Yeah, because you, you pretty much quoted it uh, verbatim. But, you know, one of the things that you get out of that course and that training is that uh, keep judgment out of it master your own story, understand the biases that you may be bringing into, but stay curious. You can pretty much ask anything that you want to ask from a position of curiosity, but as soon as judgment and assumptions creeps in and you get away from the facts, that's where all the emotions live and that's where conversations go sideways. So, you know, what, can happen sometimes, this happened with, my, with some of my clients. You know, hey, I, I tried that back in 1987 and it didn't work out so well, so I'm not gonna do it again. Like, okay, well, you know, that is an approach. You can choose that, but what if you try it again and if you see it going sideways, you just back out and then you come back in another time. You know, a lot of my clients, when, uh, when Mr. Floyd was murdered, uh, they were wondering how to talk to their employees of color about about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And just about all of them had some level of fear because they're afraid they were going to say something stupid or, or 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 you know put their foot in their mouth. And what I told them is, here's the deal: um, if you've got an employee that's hurting and you don't address it you're creating a void or a vacuum and they're going to fill that void or vacuum with their own narrative of why you're not asking them how they're doing. And so then that void or vacuum is not going to be filled with stories that are favorable to you as a leader or to the organization. So I, I it's really, it's four words. How are you doing? And then shut up. Don't say anything. Just, just shut up and listen, not listening to respond, but just listen. And if the person's not ready to speak, if the person's not ready to say something, that's not on you anymore. Uh, but at least they know that when you're ready, the door is open, but not saying anything, uh, that that's a, that's a recipe. That's a recipe for disaster. Okay. So that, you know, that actually kind of leads me over to my next question then. Um, I'm a little bit action oriented and I think you've been dropping gems as you've been going along with respect to, you know, things that people can do, you know, judgment free, be vulnerable, be curious. But I guess what else, uh, maybe some, you know, maybe top three or four things is it that you think individuals can do to foster more of these kinds of conversations and come to a better place of understanding where then we can actually do some action and see some public policy change? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great question. I, I get that a lot. And when I'm giving this talk to college students, what I typically tell them to do is, you know, when I go into the, this is way back in 2020 when you could do this, but when you go into the cafeteria and you get all one group of people sitting in one group and another group of people sitting in another group, 
that maybe you have a football team where there's a little integration, but people are sitting in their own cliques. That, like that's the same way it was in the seventies when I was in elementary school. Uh, I know somebody on the call is probably saying, no, Wes, you were in high school and so, but yeah, just trust me. It, it, it was the same way in the, uh, in the, in, in the cafeterias. And um, what I tell the college students is find the scariest person on campus that, you know, somebody that you think just, uh, maybe they just dress different th than you. Maybe they, maybe they wear a hijab and you don't understand why. Maybe they wear a yarmulke and everything. Find that person and go ask them how they're doing. Learn their story and listen, uh, because when that happens, you're going to find that there's that there's common ground. So having conversations with people that are different is going to move the needle. And I think that is the one fundamental thing that will get it started. I think uh, reading and becoming educated and uh, the guy who's the president of Elmhurst University now when I was when I joined the board, his name was Bryant Curitan. And he used to say that, you know, we bring in speakers from the left to right, the middle. We bring speakers in that have all sorts of divergent ideas. The problem is the only people that go to those talks are the ones that agree with what that speaker says. What we need are for people that don't agree with those speakers to go hear what the other side has to say and then make an informed decision. The beauty of a liberal arts education is that you can be a critical thinker and you can be a problem solver. I'm not saying that engineers aren't. I've got a sister who's an engineer who might be on the call and I don't want her getting mad at me. But at the end of the day, um, what can you what can you do to see something from the other person's lens. And obviously I'm getting at this idea of, uh, uh, of empathy, because once you can do that, again, you've got some common ground that you can, you can go to. So, you know, let's have conversations, let, let, let's get educated. Then I think another thing is, uh, yeah, uh, run for office. Yeah, politics over the last, uh, several years, and I'm just using several uh, without any specific number, uh, has has been disgusting. It's turned a lot of people off. It's made people believe that if somebody believes something that doesn't fit their narrative, they have to be their enemy. And mm -hmm. just by turning enough of us off, it's caused enough of us to say, you know what, uh, I'm going to sit on the sidelines and I'm gonna watch my TV station and I'm gonna feed my narrative and I'm just gonna be angry all the time. No, uh, put your name on a ballot, run for office, change policy. Uh, we need more people like that. But that takes that idea of, of courage. <laughs> it takes that idea of what Brene Brown talks about being, uh, being this idea of vulnerability and uh, you can't be courageous without vulnerability and vulnerability means putting yourself out there, taking a risk, doing something where the outcome isn't certain. Um, we need more people with character, more veterans, more women veterans to, uh, to run for office and to change policy and to, and, and to, and to help move our country forward. Yeah, I, 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 I believe that. I, I don't believe that one group has any necessary claim on what it means to be what it means to be an American. And I'll tell you, my dad, who is again, my hero, uh, my dad um, faced a lot of adversity um, integrating units, uh, serving in places where people had never seen a black American wearing stars. And, you know, uh, handled with a lot of grace, handled it with a lot of class. And uh, he didn't allow somebody else to determine how he was gonna how he was gonna respond or how he was gonna react. And I think uh, again, there's a whole lot there. You know, we can spend as much time as we want going through it. But I think at the end yeah. of the day, uh, getting people to uh, getting people to uh, put themselves out there and take chances is uh, is huge. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I would completely agree with that. Um, and I think just, I think you hinted at it in, in one of the answers in terms of the things that people can do, but um, being a little bit of a, a, a self-proclaimed nerd, I think one of the things that I would encourage people to do 
is to sort of review and revisit the history of the United States and take a holistic view of the history of the United States, right? I mean, I think, you know, a, a, a lot of folks may not necessarily realize that you can trace a direct arc between a lot of the things that we see from a socioeconomical and sort of cultural perspective to deliberate decisions that were made from a public policy and culture perspective that happened hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Um, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, folks have, you know, just a perfect example, right? You talked about how areas of the country are still relatively segregated, even though we had the Civil Rights Act and the Housing Act in 64, 65. You know, the country's been integrated at least that long, and yet we still live in different neighborhoods. And I think that a lot of people may not know that that was actually a result of deliberate public policy, starting with Woodrow Wilson, to not subsidize or finance, say, home buyers or home purchases for Black Americans well into, you know, up until the civil rights era. Or the fact that when city planners were making plans about where they were going to put a highway or where they were going to put a park or how they were going to zone industrial versus commercial areas, how areas where, you know, predominantly Black Americans may have lived, you know, were the target of where those things were. So, I really think that it's important to take a broad view of history of the United States and kind of understand how things operated and how things are interlinked and why you might see manifestations of things today based upon decisions that happened hundreds of years ago that hypothetically may have been reversed. And I think it also helps you then come to that conversation with a little bit of empathy because it's like, you know, you're not presuming to judge, you're not assuming to know how or why a certain person might be behaving. But you do have a lot of context. I mean, you just you just talked about your you know your colleague from Tennessee, like just that gem of knowing that his you know his hometown was the hometown of Nathan Bedford Forrest that gave you the context with the perspective of why does he think this way, why does he view me this way, why does he view the universe that way, and I'm pretty sure that then helped sort of guide the kind of kind of conversations that you had with him as well. Oh, Terry, that is such a uh, that is such a great point um, about understanding history, uh, because the history that many of us learned in our textbooks in school is not necessarily inaccurate, but it's also not complete. So th there's a story I do in a lot of my lectures. It's fairly current. And you, know, you brought up Woodrow Wilson, who, uh, <laughs> you know, everybody thinks Princeton, Woodrow Wilson. Well, no, he actually created some of the most racist policies that our country has uh, known, including with a stroke of the pen, again, segregated the federal workforce back in, uh, I believe it was 1914, maybe off by a year. Uh, but the story I tell is about a report that came out in 1910. It's called the Flexner Report. Um, and a guy named Abraham Flexner was commissioned by the American Medical Association to go around the country and look at quality quality in medical schools, because at the time, medicine wasn't necessarily a profession, meaning there were a lot of for-profit medical schools, not there's anything wrong with that, but there weren't any admission requirements. If you had money, boom, you can go become a doctor. Medicine also wasn't evidence-based. There were a lot of the term quacks out there that were trying things that were not based on evidence. They were just thought, hey, it's a good idea, let's do it. And, you know, again, if you, if you want to get creative, go back and look at where the split between MDs and doctors of osteopathy started. It goes back to this Flexter report in 1910. So at this point, you may be saying, what does this have to do with our topic? All right, so here's the deal. He went around the country, he looked at all the medical schools. And when he looked at all the medical schools, came back with a recommendation, gave people X number of years, two or three years to get in compliance or else they'd lose their accreditation. So 1910, there were seven black medical schools. His report resulted in five of them closing. So from 1910 until around 1960, uh, with a couple of exceptions, there were only two schools that black Americans that wanted to become doctors could go to. That was Howard and Meharry. Those were the only two medical schools available. And so also embedded in this report, and I'm gonna paraphrase here, but again, this is where I say, do your own work, do your research, Google it, it's Flex Report, it's right there. What he said in the report to paraphrase is that, hey, black people are gonna be 
best taken care of by black doctors um, as opposed to a poor white doctor that's treating black people. And because if they don't, uh, black people live in close proximity to white people. And we all know that black people have diseases that could carry over into the white population. And that would be devastating. Again, I'm not making this up. Please, if you're on this call, Google Flexner Report 1910. So this was kind of the way that people thought. And, you know, oh, by the way, it took the American Medical Association until 2008 uh, to apologize for this. But basically from 1910 to like, there was this thing called this germ theory where people thought that people of color um, had germs. That, that, again, Google it, do, do your own research. So um, June of, uh, of this year, June 10th of this year, there was a state senator in Ohio, uh, we'll just call him Senator Huffman, um, who made a statement, sort of a question, but then he went on to make some other statements where he said, hey, is the reason why COVID is so prevalent in colored people, that's what he said, in colored, in the colored population, is the reason why COVID is so prevalent in the, in the colored population because people, because colored people don't wash their hands. That's what he asked. He asked this at a Senate hearing to the state health commissioner and make a long story short, he ended up getting fired. But uh, if you Google the CDC's report on hand hygiene, and I do some healthcare um, consulting and we always do hand hygiene surveys and review what's being done. No one's ever at 100%. No one ever always watches it. It's a little scary if you're not in healthcare, but it's never at 100%. But the CDC did this study in July and I think it was September, or October of this year. It was recently published where they said, hey, look, here is what we're showing in terms of people washing their hands before they prepare food, after they prepare food, before they go to the bathroom, after they go to the bathroom. And what they found is that the group that was least likely to wash their hands were 18 to 24 year old white males. That, that's what the research says. Again, Google it. So back to, back to Senator Huffman. Do you know what Senator Huffman's full-time job is, state senator part-time? You know what his full-time job is? He's an emergency room that was past this. They fired him. He was an emergency room physician. Emergency room physician. So wow. when people talk about this idea of systemic racism, I'm gonna I'm gonna draw some conclusions here that aren't solid, but I'm just for the purposes of what we're talking about. First of all, could that affect his lens that he has? Could that affect the care that he provides to a person of color? Could it? Could he be looking at that person, faking that person's disease? Um, the second question that comes up is, wow, could he have been trained this way or trained by physicians that actually were taught that when they were in medical school? And again, the irony is Abraham Flexer was all about evidence-based medicine, uh, but the evidence doesn't support it. So here, here's again the, uh, the, the question, does systemic racism exist? Yeah, I, 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 I think it does. But so even something as simple as, hey, we want to improve quality in medicine, it can have some unintended consequences that affect people that are not in the majority. And that's where we've got the opportunity to go back and educate ourselves. And this quick vignette that I shared with you um, could be done in a lot of different industries. I just happened to yes. pick on medicine because I've got some uh, some experience with this. But another one that you may want to Google is it's appropriate for our group. The War Department came out of the pamphlet in 1944 called Command of the Negro Soldier. And if you read it, it was actually pretty progressive. We wouldn't use some of the same language today. But what the military was trying to do is to figure out, all right, we've got white officers leading black soldiers that have never interacted with black people and they've got all these stereotypes and basically what the introduction to this manual says, and you can Google it, uh, it's called Command of the Negro Soldier or a War Department pamphlet, just Google it, it'll show up. But what they said is that, look, saying that all Negroes are like this is like saying all Chinese or all French or all German. It's, it's just not true. And so there, the, the distribution of 
of intelligence or distribution of athletic ability runs the same through all different populations. And I love how uh, Isabel Wilkerson puts this all together. And she says, you know, using skin color as a means to distinguish people, as a means to classify people is as arbitrary as height. Again, race is, is not a scientific classification. It's a social classification. I'm going to leave that little nutshell there. People can go and, and, and they can Google it and do their own research. But what if we said, hey, you know what? If you're tall, you have to hang out with tall people. If you're short, you can't be with the tall people. So therefore, we're going to make you do the things of tall people. That would be insane. No one would ever think that. But when Africans were introduced as slaves back in 1619, again, it was just as just as arbitrary. And again, there, there's more to it than that that we don't have time yeah. to get into. But do, do, do your own research. And it's a fascinating topic. But I think at the end of the day, what I want, and if I'm passionate about it, it's because I've got a two-year-old granddaughter who, uh, who doesn't exactly look like me. When I walk around with her, uh, people are thinking, well, where did he get this kid? I, I want to have that, that day when that's not going to happen. That's not even a question. Uh, where people can can appreciate each other for their character, not because of the color of their skin. And I know I plagiarized that from some famous guy uh, way back <laughs> in the day, but I, that, that's still my dream too. I hope we can get um, to that point someday. And I think the military has really done a fantastic job of showing that it can be done, um, yeah. but there's still hard work to do. Yep. No, I, I definitely agree. And I, I from that, that famous person's quote, I kind of twist it on its head to say that, you know, and this is based off of a comment that I heard um, when I took my family to the park. Um, my, 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 my children also do not look entirely um, the same way I do. But I think it's, you know, being able to see the humanity in everybody, knowing that everybody is different and being okay and appreciating the differences in everybody. Yeah. And I, yeah. Yeah. And so the cool thing is people can evolve. Um, mm -hmm. People yeah. can, people can meet people and, and get to know people that are different than them. However you define different and realize yeah. that, you know what, you don't have to hate that person or that group of people. And again, I, I think that let, let's be honest. Uh, there's a lot of people that profit by keeping us divided by segmenting it. There may have even been a, politician recently that figured that was his path to, to, uh, to winning an election by, by slicing and dicing and dividing us. But you know what? We're, we're better than that. My mother, um, who we lost uh, two years ago, um, my mother was probably the smartest woman that I've ever met. Uh, my mother said, you know what? This will end, racism will end when we're invaded by Martians. I'm like, what? Probably like 10 at the time. No, because we always have to have somebody to hate. And so if Martians invade us, then all humans will get together and we'll all hate Martians. But we got to have an enemy. And that's uh, that's the wisdom of Louise Thornton Beckton, my uh, my uh, my mom. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Well, um, Wes, I, I, it looks like we've got maybe about 60 seconds left or so. Okay. Um, and I wanted to thank you for your time and your thoughts. It's definitely you. appreciated. And, you know, it was an honor to have the veterans on Wall Street invite me to help moderate this discussion. Um, I guess just in the last 60 seconds, do you have any parting thoughts for the audience? Um, well, I, I echo your sentiment, too. So uh, the veterans on Wall Street, the Bob Woodward Foundation, the, the women on Wall Street women, veterans on Wall Street women. On Wall Street. This is, uh, I, I don't know exactly how many people we've got on the call, but I'm willing to bet there's some people that have different backgrounds, different lenses, and maybe something that I said uh, doesn't fit your narrative. That, that, that's great. Re reach out to me, uh, call me, contact, get my contact information, uh, because then we can have a conversation. And I, I don't profess to, to know everything. I don't profess to have all the answers. Uh, but you know what? If we can all become great listeners, um, I think there's a chance this needle is going to move even more because, again, what we all want is a fair chance to be the best possible version of ourselves every day without any limitations based on what we look like. 
So that's my closing comments. And Terry, it's been a real treat getting to know you. I hope we can uh, hope we can stay in touch. No Air Force jokes. Yeah, definitely. Same. No Army jokes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So thanks, everybody, for joining. We appreciate your time. I guess I'll turn it over to our uh, tech wizards to see you guys out.